Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodian of the land we meet today and pay my respect to their elder, past, and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Then I pay my special respect to the fallen hero from the Spring Revolution in Myanmar. I also thank this man, AMI presenter Anthony, Mani, Costa, and Deza. I appreciate all our participants from different parts of the world for joining the AMI seminar today. Our AMI president, Nicholas Gobble, will open the meeting. Nicholas, the floor is yours. Everybody and welcome. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today. We've got quite a, a big program ahead of us uh, with a number of speakers, so I'll, I will get straight into it. Today's seminar is based on the book, after the coup, Myanmar's political and humanitarian crises, edited by Monique Skidmore and Anthony Ware. And we're very delighted to have both of them talking to us tonight, as well as uh, other authors from this book, um, uh, including uh, Costas Letudis and Taysan Mio Win. Um, I shall now hand over to Anthony. Let me jump right in. Um... And I'll share my screen. We're we're talking about this this book um, that Monique and I co-edited uh, after the coup, Myanmar's political and humanitarian crisis. It's been published by ANU Press, and as you'll see in a minute, um, it's free for download. So I would like to encourage everybody here to download a copy uh, or the chapters that are of interest to you and have a have a good look at that. So there's the link for downloading it, and uh, in fact, it's on the next page as well. But there's just a photograph of the cover, and I simply put this slide together so that while Monique was talking, if she didn't have anything prepared, we could show something. Um, so I wasn't uh, planning to, to be talking to it. But um, this book, uh, so there's a list of the chapters uh, and, and contributors and authors. And I'm sure that there's a good number of uh, contributors, authors there that you will recognise uh, from Australia and beyond. Uh, we we organised, oh, this book came out of a seminar that we hosted that Australia Myanmar Institute promoted back in 2022. So the coup was in, in 2021 in February. And on the first anniversary, we hosted a seminar to discuss the implications and particularly the crises that were emerging as we saw them at the beginning of 20 uh, 22 and uh, these were 15 of the well 13 uh, the first uh, the introductory chapter here and, and final chapter here uh, obviously we wrote um, sort of for the book in particular but every other chapter here was one of the papers that were pre presented at that uh, at that two-day workshop we held in Melbourne it was hybrid mode we were still in COVID and, and things were, were, were going a little bit strange for everybody um, but we managed to get some people in the room together it was in between our lockdown periods here in Melbourne. And so um, we had a very, very productive discussion. And then out of that, we spent about a year workshopping our chapters and, up, and, and trying to stay up to date with uh, what was going on in Myanmar while we um, uh, we, we, we worked through the process with Australian National University Press uh, for publication. Uh, so obviously publication in a, in a university press takes a, a few months and so time has elapsed since then. Um, but I think you'll see uh, in the, the table of contents here a very, very diverse range of topics and authors. Uh, there are a few names here that are actually pseudonyms um, that people have, particularly those who are still inside the country, have opted to to not identify themselves with their proper name uh, for obvious reasons. And then a number of others, including Tezar, who will present later in this, um, uh, in this seminar, um, who uh, who have used their uh, real um, you know, real name? Uh, we certainly respect and appreciate people um, either way uh, for the contributions they've been able to make uh, to this this publication. So look, there are fifteen amazing chapters here um, by some really uh, knowledgeable people, and I'd encourage you download a copy of the book uh, for free and have a good look, have a good read, uh, and then engage with any of the authors. Unfortunately, we had we had floated the idea of, of trying to get as many authors along to a seminar as we could and have a Q&A, but in the end, we decided that it would be a little problematic or a little slow at least, uh, and probably uh, end up focusing on one or two hot topics rather than actually engaging with each of the authors. 
Um, so uh, Nicholas is putting together the program of, of seminars that are coming uh, are going forward and we may well have a couple of other uh, uh, chapters uh, or sorry authors of other chapters who speak in the coming months uh, Nicholas will update us on what is, is or isn't there in fact Nicholas himself has a really interesting chapter uh, on multi multinationals and sanctions and so on in the book uh, that I would love to hear uh, a further update on at some point but um, uh, we'll see quite where all the future seminars go but for today what we thought we would do is we would narrow in a little more on Rakhine State in particular and you'll see the two chapters here on um, uh, chapter 9 and 10 that were both looking at Rakhine State conflict Arakan Army and Rohingya um, situation and uh, so we thought um, or Nicholas proposed that we uh, we focus the seminar on that so uh, we've got the uh, we've got three of the four authors along this evening to talk about those two chapters in particular kind of to to highlight the book and where the book is going but also to capitalize or to to uh, bring us up to date on some really interesting um, and challenging uh, new directions that uh, that have, have occurred since the coup um, so I'm going to quickly speak uh, on what was covered in the chapter and then I'm going to hand over to my co-author for that chapter, um, Costas Lautidis, who will speak about uh, events since then, uh, who will then hand over to Tezar Mjolwin, uh, who will uh, go... Uh, let me back up just a whisker previous, sorry, uh, who will who will also then talk about uh, the sort of the communal tensions after the coup and uh, and bring us up to date on, on what's happened in Rakhine uh, since then. So hopefully a really interesting um, lineup and, 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 and seminar. Um, so let me just jump straight into a, a brief overview of what we have in the chapter nine of the book. So, um, Rakhine State. I think everybody here knows where it's located on the map. Uh, what we, what the book, uh, what the chapter covers is, a, is just a, a quick overview of the conflict in Rakhine State in particular, which is very, very different in many regards to that that's happening in the north of the country and the east of the country. Um, the talk about the briefly about the rise of the Arakan Army, uh, and then a little bit of a theory section that we won't uh, unpack too much today, but uh, uh, talking about in general, how uh, emerging political entities like the Arakan army seek to uh, gain legitimacy through state building. But then in particular, and what I want to talk ab about uh, briefly then is the way that uh, since the coup that the Arakan Army and the ULA have consolidated and done some state building and nation building, particularly focusing on establishing peace with the Rohingya, um, which I think will be of everybody's interest. So uh, let me jump straight into it. Um, before the coup, uh, it seemed like Rakhine and particularly the Rohingya situation was kind of central to most of, for several years uh, after the, the ethnic cleansing event uh, in Myanmar, um, after the, the mass exodus of Rohingya across the border into Bangladesh. Uh, Rakhine was kind of the number one thing that almost everybody talked about. And in some ways, things went really quiet because the... Um, uh, Rakhine State uh, conflict, um, the, effectively a, a de facto coup that was never anything signed, but a coup from early 1920, uh, 19, 2020, uh, so uh, several months before the coup, uh, through to um, at least the end of 2022, um, led to uh, Rakhine probably being amongst the most stable part of the country, country uh, with the least political action, the least support for the CDM movement. Uh, and a, a, a very distant sort of relationship with the NUG and certainly no active fighting and active resistance to the SAC and the military regime uh, in that first year. Um, I'll come back to talk a bit more about that in a second, but... Um, uh, the Rakhine conflict, uh, let me just, uh, again, the, the chapter elaborates at some, uh, you know, for several pages on the nature of the conflict in Rakhine State. The things I want to draw attention to primarily are that uh, decades, uh, the, uh, the conflict has really gone on for, for many decades. Um, since 2012, obviously, there's been a resurgence of violence, but the underlying tensions and, and episodes of violence go back decades. Uh, and, and we would analyse this as being... Um, 
um, tripartite. So the international community is often focused on the way the state, particularly the military, have oppressed the Rohingya. Uh, and inside the country, most attention has been on the Rakhine Rohingya relationship or the relationship between Muslims and Rakhine in that state. Um, the dimension that we focus on in this chapter in particular is, is that between the Rakhine, in this case, the Arakan army, and the, the, the state, um, both military and the, the government, including when um, the, the uh, uh, NLD were the government of the day, um, and the degree of, of nationalism and even resentment even against the NLD government at the time. So I don't want to go into a lot of detail uh, other than to highlight the fact that in every democratic election held in Myanmar uh, in 1951 to 1956, 1960, 1990, 2010, 2015 and 2020, the, the nationalist vote for nationalist parties, not the equivalent of the NLD as we, whichever exi whatever existed at the time, but the nationalist vote for Rakhine nationalist parties uh, was amongst the highest of any ethnic group in the country. So this idea of Rakhine nationalism fighting for their own independence, um, go, it, it runs very deep in the country. The Arakan army, and I've spoken about Arakan army in AMI seminars before, so I'm not going to rehash the same old ground again, um, other than to quickly say it formed in 2009, initially in Kachin state, and the initial recruits were really fr uh, uh, um, ethnic. Rakhine who were working in the jade mines in Kachin state uh, and they originally based with the um, KIA and trained with the Kachin uh, there they were a member of the Northern Alliance along with the MNDAA and the TNLA uh, and they only began operations in Rakhine state in 2014 which makes everything that's happened since then really really significant in 2014 2015 they were excluded from talks uh, around the um, national ceasefire agreement and they were excluded from the Panlong 2 dialogue process uh, under the NLD government at that time, considered to be new upstarts and branded both by the NLD and the military at that time as being terrorists. Um, so let me just jump forward. Uh, the, we're talking about the, um, uh, the sorry, there's a, a section in the book talking about um, the way, uh, a bit of theory about the way emerging uh, armies or groups like this seek to gain international recognition. I'm not going to, to elaborate, uh, I'll direct you to that. What I really do want to uh, a direct, uh, a talk about is what they did in the ceasefire period 2020 to 2022 in particular before Costas gives a, a, and um, Tazar give us a bit more of an update. Now the first thing they did was to really focus on um, Three things, sorry. Consolidation of the Arakan army as a, as a military uh, entity. So firstly, they, they they really strengthened their recruitment. They now claim to have over 30,000. I think the latest claim was 32,000 soldiers, which would make them almost as big as the Wa and certainly the biggest of the ethnic armed groups other than the Wa in Myanmar, if that is true. They claim to have more than three and more than 100 battalions of soldiers. Um, uh, and the, 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 the sense of community support uh, of the, the sense of legitimacy within the Rakhine ethnic community and some of the ethnic minorities is really, really strong. Uh, so they've really worked on building a business support base uh, and that, that connection to communities, even at the point of and this is really rare for for uh, armies like this uh, to for uh, uh, you know to apologise for accidental shootings and uh, apologise for various injustices that have happened. I mentioned school flags because quite a few schools uh, as early as 2022 started showing the Rakhine the, the Arakan army flag in 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 lieu of the Myanmar flag uh, outside the school. The second thing they really focused on is is the building of a state administration. So they formed the the ULA the the, uh, the 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 democratic or the the kind of political arm of the AA and really focused on institutionalization and bureaucratization. So forming a civil administration, forming a police kind of functionality, definitely setting up a, a judicial function with court systems, mostly online. Uh, technically centered in Marakul, which is uh, the uh, which is really quite significant given its place in Myanmar his, in Rakhine history, um, and um, and setting up as I said courts in particular 
dollar all the way down to the village tract level, but also engaging in healthcare and certainly uh, pandemic orders throughout Rakhine, the northern Rakhine state were given by the Arakan army rather than the military uh, and vaccine delivery during um, uh, the pandemic, etc. And the third thing they focused on, and I'm, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm sort of racing through uh, uh, what is, is a detailed chapter, uh, is, is their nation building efforts. So nation building as opposed to state building. State building is building the institutions. Nation building is building a sense of, of, of identity as a single group of people uh, that could potentially be ruled uh, in a potential autonomous zone or or, or some such entity that the Arakan army might try to, uh, is definitely trying to win uh, you know, control of the state in order to be able to administer. So there's about 630, um, uh, uh, I, I can see I've left a word out there, 630,000 Rohingya are left in Rakhine state. Um, so with a million uh, having been driven across the border, there's still a sizable popula population. And one of the really distinctive things about what the Arakan army have done uh, is to focus uh, 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 their language uh, and all of their rhetoric has been very inclusive, uh, almost exclusively uh, talking about everybody living in the state of Arakan, being a citizen of, of Arakan uh, and using some very, very inclusive language which, which has translated to some extent in including Rohingya even in the ULA, the, the bureaucracy that they're setting up and so on, um, and uh, and so on. So I'm going to jump forward because I know that Costas and Taser want to talk about this a lot. The big issue, of course, is still um, uh, rights, for example, group rights around the use of the name Rohingya, um, but I'm not going to go into that any further. I'm going to leave it right there. There's a bit more in the chapter, um, but I think that gives you a little bit of a taste on what we've been uh, uh, of what the chapter covers. And I'd like to hand over to Costas now to bring us up to date with, with, with uh, things since the end of that chapter uh, with goings on in Rakhine. Costas. Thank you, Anthony. Hello, everyone. Very glad to be with you uh, uh, today. So um, I think that a few of the updates that we can provide with Anthony and Teresa here are related to what has happened since we completed this uh, this book. And there is a number of issues that I'm going that's just to touch upon, but I'm more than happy to elaborate during the questions and uh, 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 the question time. So the first thing, which is a quite general one, and that is on a particular set of events, is the level of social cohesion that has been increased between the ethnic Rakhine and, Rohing and the ethnic Rohingya in, um, in the region. Uh, and this comes also from the data that we have collected from our recent research project in the region. Actually, about a month ago with Anthony, we were in Thailand and we have been discussing with a number of uh, uh, local peace activists who, who uh, uh, met together. So uh, one very major test about this social cohesion that has been uh, promoted by the Arakan army as well and the ULA was uh, what happened with Cyclone Mocha or Cyclone Mocha, uh, and the fact that we didn't have any uh, disruption of the social cohesion, there was a lot of effort to uh, provide humanitarian assistance on an equal basis between the communities. Uh, we know from the data we have collected there has been a lot of effort from uh, not only uh, ethnic kin to assist their ethnic kin, but also uh, we have evidence that uh, uh, Rakhine CSOs will try to assist Rohingya villages and the other way around. So Cyclone Mocha was the first test uh, uh, for the social cohesion uh, front. Uh, the, second, the second test is associated with the escalation of violence since November 2023 where we have a rapid progress of the AA on the military front. And uh, also from our field work, and something that has come also in some reports right now, uh, is associated with the fact that uh, there is mention that Rohingya now joined the AA, the military branch of the AA, not the civil branch, not the ULA, uh, which demonstrates an increase in the trust uh, uh, about how the AEA is trying to deploy the Arakan, the Arakan dream. On that front, we had an interview uh, on the BBC Burma on the 2nd of February by the leader of AEA, who reiterated again once more 
that the Arakan dream concerns uh, all the communities in the country. He didn't name the Rohingya. He never named the Rohingya as such, but always talks in an inclusive language. He talks about all ethnic groups in 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 Rakhine. And he, read, he reiterated in that interview that uh, the Arakan dream is impossible unless everyone is united in that. Uh, also, very important is that uh, we, on the on the uh, war front, we have the fall of Mraukku, which uh, is very symbolic because Mraukku, as we know, has been the uh, capital of the independent uh, Rakhine Kingdom before the arrival of the Burmese. So that uh, increased rapidly the morale uh, and the optimism uh, among the Rakhine. Uh, what is, however, really concerning is the fact that we have an increase on hate speech against ethnic Rakhine, not only in Rakhine, but across the country. And to that front, also the Mabata uh, has been implicated. And there is increasing fear uh, about retribution against ethnic Rakhine, especially in Yangon and Mandalay. Uh, apart from what is happening in social media, there are leaflets on the streets, uh, you know, uh, urging people not to shop from, you know, uh, uh, from shops where, which are owned by ethnic Rakhine and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of fear of that. There is an increase uh, uh, in hate speech, which indicates uh, the uneasiness of the military and the crisis point that the military is reaching uh, on that. Um, another quite controversial, very well, uh, we, we were talking with Anthony about that. Uh, as you probably know, the, uh, the military has introduced conscription. So what we see is uh, uh, the military trying to recruit Rohingya to fight for the Burmese military, which is, I don't know. I mean, you know, given the seriousness of the situation, you cannot laugh, but, you know, you question the logic of all that. Uh, what are they thinking, you know, to try to invite and recruit Rohingya uh, while a few years ago they committed a genocide against them? But again, this is a point of crisis uh, in our in our reading uh, about where the situation is heading. Uh, and finally, uh, before giving the floor to, to Tezar, uh, we think, uh, as we discuss quite frequently uh, with Anthony and Tezar, we think that one of the biggest or probably the thorniest question for the future of uh, Rakhine under the Arakan army, and if you like, it's going to be the test case about their intentions on what kind of polity they want to build and how they're going to promote it and protect it uh, has to do with the repatriation. The biggest question is how they're going to handle the repatriation of uh, the Rohingya refugees from Cox's Bazaar. Uh, they have been silent. When we try to talk to people during the field work, uh, both sides, both ethnic Rakhine and Rohingya who live in uh, um, uh, in Rakhine right now, uh, CSO members, etc. Uh, they have been quite silent, quite careful in their wording. Uh, there's a lot of reluctance. But in our, from our perspective, I think that this is going to be the biggest test for the Arakan army, regardless of the inclusive language, regardless of what they're trying to achieve. I think this is going to be how they're going to handle the repatriation, what kind of agenda they're going to build up, what kind of roadmap they're going to, to offer. Uh, we think it's going to be uh, the biggest test case for them. Uh, especially uh, towards the international community. So I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to give the floor to Tezar to follow on. Thank you. Thank you, Costa. Uh, hello. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm uh, very happy to present uh, finding from our paper. So <clears throat> our paper uh, particularly focus on the impact of the political crisis, particularly the military coup, and then how these uh, impact on the communal tension between Rakhine and Rohingya, and as well as how the both community respond to that uh, political crisis. So we try to we seek to understand how both community trying to respond to that development. So after the coup, so one side we are uh, trying to look at the about the the formation of identity for the vulnerable group a uh, Rohingya community. On the other side, we uh, would like to we try to uh, examine the claim of autonomy by the Arakanese and then ULAE. So just after the November 2022 election, so AA uh, took 
the temporary seat fire with the military. So since that time, it trying to expand their uh, governing structure in the Rakhai. So including like judiciary and administration, administrative system as well as public service. So since that time, so both community, both Rakhai and Rohingya relying on the AA uh, service. So including like uh, judicial, administrative and public service rather than the uh, state institution by run by the military. So uh, in the beginning, like a did not a and Rakhai uh, population did not join the resistance movement, uh, which was happening nationwide after the coup. So for uh, Rakhai community, like both the military and and the government and and NUG are the same for that. So maybe uh, because of the management of the previous entity government on the Rakhine issue. For them, uh, they see that this is the issue between like, uh, between a Burma politician, right? Between Burma uh, entity government military. So that's why we regularly see the uh, old AA as well as the Rakhine population join the resistance movement after the coup. So uh, for Rohingya community, they see that so the political crisis, the coup, it uh, delayed for the repatriation and resettlement of the Rohingya refugee. So, but uh, after the coup, like the uh, the government uh, found by the resistance movement, like ousted the elective member from the entity, they found like a national unity government. So this government body brings the Rohingya issue in their political uh, sector after the coup. So for the resistance movement, they release the number of statements about the Rohingya and to grandi about their citizenship. So to respond to that development, so for the Rakhine community, but um, most of the Rakhine community uh, does, do not see about this development. And then as a positive development, some, some of the Rakhine uh, community uh, upset about this development because they think that the energy movement does not uh, concert with the Rakhine key stakeholder or Rakhine population. But for Rohingya community, even though they are working about this development, they could not uh, publicly uh, endorse or support about this statement because they need to be kept, uh, careful and they need to prioritize their relationship between the Rakhine community. So, and then we also see that the, after the coup, like uh, Professor Costa and only mentioned, the communal relationship like relatively uh, increase in, in terms of in cultural activity, social and the business. So uh, like Rohingya community can freely travel around the Rakhai and then they can work because after the coup, the military could not like uh, effectively uh, control uh, in the Rakhine state. Uh, on the other hand, a also a and Rakhine population allow the Rohingya community to freely come out from IDB and also for uh, for their livelihood. So this is like the improvement. But however, we don't see uh, no arrangement for uh, repatriation and both community have different concerns like regarding repatriation. So Rakhine see that uh, this is still the issue for the deployment of military troops in the village and also the landmines, so this is the state issue. But for Rohingya, so they also concerned about uh, like how were, who were granted of their safety and livelihood and the right to return their original place and original villages. So both have like different concern. And like uh, Professor Costa also mentioned, like uh, regarding the recent uh, interview with the general Termini, the leader of AE, but he, when the, the journalist asked about the repatriation, but he doesn't uh, mention exactly anything about the repatriation, but he said their current movement and their like vision for the way of Rakhida include all uh, ethnic group in Rakhai. But he also noted that one point, so, but they won't accept any uh, the political motive like behind the, like for the, we have the attempt to change the narrative of the Rakhine and Arakan history. So, but 
we don't know exactly what is the main the political motive, like trying to attempt to change the narrative of Rakhine history. So he said he won't accept about that. But we don't know exactly what is the main. But my interpretation is that uh, Rakhine population and AA currently try would like to try to uh, arrange the human rights and like fundamental rights and basis rights. But however, it's still uh, a long way to accept like recognize the identity of the Rohingya and the political participation and it's still a long way to resolve this issue. So Rakhine, on the other hand, Rakhine community are not ready yet to accept like the term Rohingya because they stay concerned about the political motive behind it, like such as like territorial claim or like self-determination. So why uh but Another thing, uh, they also have. Uh, we also see that there's a different perception between uh, among the Rohingya community, uh, between people inside the Rakhine and also people like uh, outside the country, particularly diaspora community. But in inside the country, uh, inside the Rakhine state for Rohingya community, their priority is like their livelihood and to be a good relationship between Rakhine because for their daily livelihood, they need to rely on to interact between like Rakhine community. So that's why for them, so we see the decline of uh, claim for the identity for them, but they are, now they are happy for the improvement of current relationship, so for their livelihood. But on the other hand, like diaspora community, they strongly stay believe for uh, the claim for the identity and Rohingya. So this is the uh, divided between uh, even the Rohingya community, the diaspora group and uh, people inside the country. But it doesn't mean uh, uh, the Rohingya community inside the country does not want their identity, but currently they, are, they prioritize because the both community and the Rakhine state is so far very, very long time for the conflict, uh, communal conflict as well as uh, M conflict. That's why they are very, very cautious about any uh, like sensitive issue. Uh, instead, they would like to try to be relationship and then trust building between two communities to improve their livelihood and peaceful for both community. So uh, uh, for the sake of time, so this is the uh, key finding from our uh, paper. But recent development is we can see that the end conflict in, in Rakhai resumed between A and uh, military and in the daily basis A trying to control the territory and almost like uh, the north, northern Rakhai and as well as some central part of the Rakhai in the daily basis A attack the military outposts and control the uh, territory and townships and then like uh, Professor Costa mentioned so now both uh, military and AA accused and pointed out each other, uh, like uh, the uh, suppressing the Rohingya community. A accused the military trying to forcefully recruit uh, Rohingya to fight against AA. But military also accused AA, like trying to mobilize the uh, Muslim community in Rakhai to against the military. So now both point out each other. But on the other hand, the uh, obviously, the uh, Rohingya population are also the most vulnerable in the current like end conflict. So this is the uh, current uh, uh, latest update. So in the Rakhine state. So I will stop in here and then we'll let uh, the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Buddhiza. Thank you. Yeah. If, if perhaps I can uh, ask a question first. Uh, uh, given the, the role of the Arakan army in the 1027 uh, s battlefield uh, successes and uh, afterwards, to what extent do the, does the Arakan army share the objectives of many others in the anti-coup movement for a rewriting of Myanmar and of the politics of Myanmar and the creation of a new federated Myanmar? Or are they really... Uh, opportunistically joining in and seeking something more than that, uh, an independent Rakhine state? That's a really big question. Um, if I can jump in first, uh, I would say it's probably a bit of both, Nicholas. Um, it's probably not clear that it's either one or the other. Um, 
they the Arakan army have maintained very close um, ties uh, and worked very very closely with the, the within the the Three Brothers Alliance, and so they've been engaged uh, with the MNDAA and the TLNA uh, in the north of the country. Um, so in that sense, they are committed to something broader than simply Rakhine State. But that said, they are also very, very committed to autonomy, maybe more than independence. But but they 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 desperately want a, a very clear sense of uh, rule and um, and. Uh, uh, if there's going to be a federal relationship um, come out of after whatever comes post coup, uh, when we finally do see an end to this, then they would expect a high degree of federal sort of autonomy within a federal union, uh, rather than rather than than minimal. So they would they'd be very much looking to control the police system, perhaps a a, a high degree of of legal uh, law making and justice within the state and so on. So I think what they're looking for is is still a high degree of autonomy, um, but for the time being, at least, they, 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 they've got their lot in with uh, the idea of a federal union. Um, but they haven't ruled out, um, neither have they ruled out the idea of an independent state if all else fails. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Nicholas, for the question. Uh, going to the most recent interview to the BBC, uh, the question was about independence. And the answer was interesting because uh, uh, the leader said, uh, we haven't declared independence yet. Uh, and I think that what they are thinking is how, th depending on how things are going to shape up vis-a-vis -vis the, the whole of Myanmar, they are going to position themselves. I don't think that at the moment they are looking for independence because they are serious questions about viability. Uh, and this is something that we come across in secessionist cases all over the world. Uh, however, as Anthony said, probably they are more keen into some form of quite extended autonomy, uh, not federation. I would probably border towards confederation. So just a step before independence, uh, quite extended uh, uh, autonomous rule on a number of issues, probably or maybe some aspects of foreign policy and defense to be centrally controlled, and that's it. But I think that what happens in Rakhine, Nicholas, is part of what happens with the ethnic communities altogether. They fight their own war at the moment in Myanmar. Uh, and this is one of the biggest problems, uh, the problem of coordination between the national unity government and uh, the resistance movement and the ethnic groups. Uh, so I think that what happens in Rakhine feeds into, into this uh, uh, challenge, if you like. There's um, a question coming from Vicky Bowman, which uh, builds on this. And she asks, assuming there is one day a post-coup union government, what, what would it need to agree to politically, linguistically, economically for Rakhine State to prevent uh, effective secession of Rakhine? along the lines of Somaliland under the ULAAA. I mean, I think you've touched on that a little bit, but are these issues of, of linguistics and uh, uh, also an important issue? Regarding uh, that issue, but also based on the first question, but he always claimed uh, the way of Rakita. So but when, according to our uh, fee work and when we interview uh, a few people, both Rakhine and Rohingya community, but uh, the general population don't understand exactly the ultimate goal of the AA. But however, they feel that uh, this is good for them, like to stay uh, Rakhine uh, in the Rakhine, but only the Rakhine people can govern, so the region. So, but what we understand is like uh, Professor Costa mentioned, it would be like. Uh, mostly the most decentralized form of Fadre or maybe uh, Confederate. But they are, the current situation maybe is stay open and uh, see the situation uh, for them. But I'm sure that uh, they won't accept any way for like previous system, a centralized Fadre or any other uh, form of system previously, they won't accept like that. But even of a federal, it would be more like 
really, really decent, the most decentralized federalism. But for the second question, also related, but if the union government can make an arrangement to the the extent of like autonomy, self autonomy and determination, if they can grantee for the autonomy of the Rakhine people, but uh, I I hope they might stay dry. Thank you, Tessa. Uh, I've got a question, question in from David Cameroo, which is uh, takes it one step further, and he asks whether the possibility of a separate Rohingya state is an option in a federated Myanmar. I would think that would be a a good option, uh, personally, but I also think that realities on the ground would make it almost a hundred percent impossible, in my view. Um, the the claims of the Rakhine people over the whole of northern Rakhine state um, make that incredibly difficult. And I, I think unless um, a, a Rohingya state was simply in Mangtor and no no further than uh, uh, inland from, from Mount Dor, that this, this would have no option whatsoever. That said, I could see a future conceivably, and Costas and I have just got a paper under review that should hopefully be published later this week in development in practice, looking at the possibility of Rohingya. And I could see a scenario emerge um, where Arakan army were so desperate for international recognition to bolster their claims for autonomy that they traded with the international community for the return of the Rohingya into, say, Mount Thor, um, or and, and 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 so on, you know, in exchange for international recognition, particularly if part of that was um, uh, involved, for example the rights to some of the uh, uh, the offshore oil, etc. Uh, if the international community and China were prepared to guarantee those uh, royalty flows from the gas fields and so on, uh, going to the Arakan army, that uh, international in, in exchange for international recognition and the return of the Rohingya, I could see that as plausible. And in that scenario, would would there a separate Rohingya state within within a Rakhine autonomous region or something be even plausible? I don't know, but this the, the 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 repatriation question is probably even bigger in some ways, and how the Arakan army would handle that. I think um, at this stage, the idea of Rohingya within a as a, in, in relating to the central government is almost off the table, while the Arakan army are controlling that territory. So it's really a question of what uh, what would the Arakan army be, how far would they be prepared to trade uh, in 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 exchange for gaining the autonomy and the recognition they need. Thank you. Now, could I just remind everybody, if you do have a question, please put it in, in the chat box. We have questions that are asking about the funding of the Arakan army. Uh, where do they get their funding from? Has Saudi Arabia contributed to, to their resources? Okay, good. Now, uh, very quickly, Nicolas, to the question about funding. So what we know is that they have a, a quite effective taxation system. So they do have a, a source of revenue from the taxation on the territories that they exercise control. Also, we know that they receive donations by some Rakhine uh, prominent nationalists. Now, uh, also, we have seen reports where the military accuses uh, AA for smuggling. Uh, and to make profit. And of course, we have AEA accusing the military for the same. Now, we wouldn't be surprised if we see some sinister activity taking place uh, in order to generate income. This is something typical in similar scenario all over, uh, all over the world. Uh, so we don't know. We know, for example, that the, uh, the weapons that they got come via China. Uh, and some of them may be also Chinese. So China is aware of what is happening, of course, and they tolerate that, uh, which, of course, can raise a number of different questions about the role of China in this situation, but I will leave it to the audience whether they want to take the conversation there or not. Uh, that's from me. Thanks. Thank you, Costa. Regarding one of the questions in this uh, check about, uh, about the uh inclusive of Rohingya situation so I would like to add one point so when we find out in our field work so after the coup like one a trying to expand their uh, governance structure they also mobilize the Rohingya community they 
the AA like representative and authority trying to go and meet with the Rohingya population and the village. And they also give a message. We need to try to first establish like a, the Rakhai state or Rakhai nation. So they are, they shared about their uh, ultimate goal of the ULAA. And then they granted after we win, after we success our goal. So the first thing we will do for you is like to grant your citizenship and citizenship rights. And then now you need to, you all need to participate. So in our dream. So in this way, the Rakai, uh, the ULA trying to like mobilize all group in the uh, Rakai. So for the sake of their ultimate goals, including Rohingya. And then they also like, uh, Professor Anthony Acosta already mentioned, they also uh, invite the Rohingya to join. So in their governance structure, now, not only in uh, administrative, uh, administrative system, but also in the military. So this is the one of the things that they try to mobilize and try to include the Rohingya community and in, the, in their uh, attempt uh, to win. Anthony, you mentioned that there were 630,000 Rohingya still in Rakhine State. And we have a question which asks whether uh, we would in, you anticipate any further uh, exodus of Rohingya in, into Bangladesh, or are the overtures towards them by the AA um, sufficient to, to to make it more attractive for them to be staying? So one, uh, it's a question of being voluntarily, would they be seeking to leave? Yeah. Um, so uh, in short answer, um, Bangladesh is scared of that at the moment. Um, so the discussion inside Bangladesh has shifted in the last couple of months from uh, discussions about uh, and proposals about repatriation beginning to now expressing concern that more uh, refugees will come across the border. And the main reason for that is that there's been an, in, uh, an uptick in fighting uh, by the AA against the military in in Mongdor. Um, and so where there are some Rohingya communities um, in Mongdor still, particularly up in the north, there's been some skirmishes and fighting around AA around Rohingya villages that uh, leaves the Bangladeshis concerned that there may be an exodus. Um, at this stage, that's not really eventuated. Uh, and what I would point out is in terms of the uh, displacement caused by the Arakan army uh, and the military clashes across the, the whole of Rakhine state, the UNDP's latest, uh, oh, sorry, the UN um, uh, HCR's latest uh, figures uh, from the end of January suggested that uh, that in excess of 180,000 ethnic Rakhine and other minorities are currently displaced by the fighting inside um, um, Myanmar uh, inside Rakhine State, but uh, but uh, but only um, I want to say but uh, thirty three thousand of those thirty three thousand six hundred are Rohingya. Now I'm just simply saying that to highlight that displacement's a major issue across all of the, the combat areas of Rakhine State, and, uh, but proportionally to the remaining Rohingya or ethnic Rakhine population, you would actually see that the majority of those who are displaced currently are ethnic. Rakhine. Rakhine and and um while there is some ongoing threat of further displacement of Rohingya that might lead some across the border, there's actually a much higher, the, the current displacement is skewed towards ethnic Rakhine villages being displaced even more than uh, Rohingya villages. I hope that kind of answers the question. Thank you. Um, well, perhaps uh, I could ask also, I mean, you mentioned 630,000, that struck me as a rather large number. Uh, what proportion of those are, uh, you know, living in communities rather than in in the, the in the camps, in totally displaced people camps? Good question. So um, currently, um, 630,000 is the UNHCR's um, best estimate, uh, and it's been floated around the aid community fairly widely. There's still 120,000 in camps, in IDP camps um, from, from 2012 uh, that really have not been able to return home. And as I say, a further 33,600 uh, are, are said to be in temporary um, IDP camps that have been set up fleeing the current fighting, which would be about 100, what did I say, 153 154,000. So that's about a quarter of the Rohingya population in Rakhine are not living in their villages, but are living in some sort of displacement camp. We don't have much time left, but there is uh, another question here, which uh, which asks about the role of Japan and the Sasakawa. Uh, and are they seeking to, is he in particular, 
seeking to play a role again in the conclusion of a ceasefire? And how is China weighing in on the parties in the conflict given its strategic interests at play? Uh, Japan uh, had achieved the previous ceasefire uh, in the region. Uh, I don't know, we don't know, unless Andron has uh, a, any more info to that, I don't know whether Japan is actually trying to, to achieve a ceasefire. China recently, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, ambassador in Bangladesh said that they are trying to achieve a ceasefire in the region, uh, actually responding to the anxiety that uh, Andron just mentioned on the Bangladeshi side about uh, the rise of uh, the, the potential of uh, flows of refugee flows to the country. So China, this is what uh, uh, the Chinese ambassador mentioned. We don't know, uh, we don't have any more uh, information to that, but what is different is that this operation, which is under uh, a different, if you like, strategic concept to what has been happening three years ago. So I don't think that the Arakan army is keen to any ceasefire at the moment, especially uh, feeling that they have the upper hand and they can carry on with the offensive. Uh, at least before entering into any ceasefire uh, conversation, they will try to maximize the strategic gains on the ground before entering into that. And I think that we haven't reached that point. The more the military retreats, if you like, or the more the, the vulnerability of the military increases, uh, uh, I think that that minimizes the possibility of having any so, any form of negotiation. But, uh... <clears throat> We're running close to seven o'clock, uh, which I, I know that our presenters and I have to, to leave at that time precisely, but there is a few more minutes. Um, Vicky has asked a further on question in relation to um, what the ULAAA relationship is to the PRCF uh, draft union constitution, and is there a draft Rakhine state constitution? Costas actually had a separate chapter we weren't talking on tonight um, that touched on this, so I'll hand this to Costas. Uh, well, actually, the second part of the question about whether we have a draft or a kind state constitution responds to the earlier question about what are their intentions politically and linguistically in a future uh, unified uh, uh, post coup uh, Myanmar. So, at the moment, we haven't seen anything like that. And actually, we were wondering why they haven't come up with at least some form of, you know, of a model uh, of what kind of polity they want to build. So we haven't seen anything. Even there is a discussion of whether they're going to be a, a single party sort of entity or a multi-party, democrat more democratic. We don't really know uh, what is the political vision in that front. Uh, the ULA is not mentioned in the draft constitution chapter of Myanmar. Uh, there is no reference to, to the ULA as such. Uh, however, there is a, a reference to um, the increased, the recognition of sovereignty to the territory. So the draft constitution for the post coup Myanmar begins by recognizing uh, uh, the territorial aspect of sovereignty. So sovereignty belongs to the federal states, not to the central authority. And this is the starting point in order to build up the federation. So uh, in a way, it increases the visibility of uh, the state territories. Uh, however, as I discussed in the, in the chapter, uh, especially with regard to the Rohingya, it doesn't go to any great lengths in order to justify their collective presence. So they do recognize them or they allow space, they create the space to recognize them as individuals, but not as a collective. And this is a major issue, I think, which actually the AA is trying to address in a different way. So I'm mindful of the time because we have only three minutes. So, uh, Tezer, would you like to add something to that? Uh, no, not much. Like you mentioned, uh, from the from the public available information, we don't see anything yet. And and also, in terms of the relation between current like uh, resistant government energy and AE, we don't see yet any uh, formal or uh, agreement on the public. But we see a few 
informal meeting between NUG and E, but we don't know anything about what they discussed between that meeting. Yeah. Thank you, Godiza. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for your contribution. Thank you very much, Costas and Teza.